today about evolution of life on Earth and about fossils and the fossil record. What is evolution? Well, evolution is often described as change through time, and that's a pretty apt description. But a better one is to think about biological evolution as descent with modification. And what that means is that each subsequent generation is modified a little bit from the previous generation. And so species over time change. The theory of evolution says that all present day species are modified descendants of life forms that have lived during the past. And if you follow that to its logical extent, then all life today is descended from the very first life. Now, evolution is much more controversial than it should be. It's in fact very well understood, and it forms the underpinnings of all of modern biology. Genetics, biochemistry, neurobiology, ecology, physiology, all biological disciplines are informed by the idea of evolution. In addition, it's fundamental to biology, as we just said, and paleontology. It is the unifying theory that explains all living and fossil organisms. And it is a scientific theory, an explanation that is testable and has been supported by all of the evidence so far. So back up a smidge, what is a scientific theory? Remember that a scientific theory is a hypothesis that has been tested and is supported by all available evidence. And it's a framework by which new hypotheses can be formulated and tested and new data evaluated. And it is falsifiable. And that means that if there is a test that proves wrong, then the, then the scientific theory will be proven wrong. So far, there haven't been any scientific studies that have proven evolution wrong. Some other scientific theories that you might remember, plate tectonics, quantum mechanics, the theory of relativity, the wave theory of sound. So where did this idea of evolution come from? Well, we often tie it with Charles Darwin. He was a scientist born in 1809, died in 1882. Darwin did not come up with the idea of biological evolution. It had been around a long time before him. Darwin's contribution was to propose a mechanism for evolution, the idea of natural selection, which is a specific way that evolution could occur. Later, genetics and DNA have proven that this mechanism is indeed correct. So what did Darwin read that led him to his ideas? One of the things he read was a book by Thomas Malthus called On the Principle of Population. Now, Malthus was uh, a little bit older than Darwin. He was born in 1766, and his ideas about population and about species groups were published before Darwin left for his journey to the Galapagos, and Darwin had read them and thought about them. In Malthus's thesis, he made several observations. Birth rates are very high, populations of species tend to be very stable, but natural resources are limited. And from this he inferred the following, that there is a struggle for survival, that many individuals will die young before they rep reproduce, before they mature, and that a fraction of individuals will survive, and that fraction is based on limited resources. So with that idea about how populations work, um, and with some other work that Darwin had read, he'd read work from early geologists, he understood the laws of stratigraphy, he understood the fossil record and how it was being interpreted, um, and so he had some geology and some paleontology in his head as well when he left on his journey for the Galapagos. And there he developed his ideas about natural selection. Now there's four key concepts in natural selection that all work together to put the theory in place. The first of these is that populations have variations in traits that can be inherited. And this is just an observation that individuals have different size, speed, agility, other kinds of things, and those things vary from individual to individual. 
From that, Darwin concluded or inferred that some of those variations are more favorable than others. They give it a competitive edge to survival, to acquiring resources, to avoiding predators, to reproducing. Now, another observation that's key to natural selection is that not all individuals will survive to reproductive maturity. That's an observation that Malthus made. So those variations that make an individual more adapted to their environment, those individuals will survive in higher numbers, and they'll reproduce in higher numbers, and they'll pass on those favorable traits to their offspring. In fact, they will mate with other individuals with favorable variations, and the two of them together will produce offspring that are even better adapted. And so over time, a population eliminates traits that aren't helpful to survival and accentuates traits that are. That is evolution, evolving with a changing ecosystem. Survival, then, is maybe better described as reproduction of the fittest. Now, while we're here, let's just back up a smidge and talk about this idea of not all individuals surviving to reproductive maturity. From that notion has come a sort of tongue-in-cheek award called the Darwin Award. Perhaps you've heard of it. If not, you might want to Google it sometimes because it makes for some very interesting reading. But a Darwin Award is not something you want. It is given out rather tongue-in-cheek to individuals who do something so stupid that they remove themselves from the gene pool before they are able to reproduce, usually by killing themselves. Makes for some pretty entertaining reading sometime, is not relevant to geology. So what did Darwin not know? Darwin published The Origin of Species in 1859. On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection was the name of his book. He had a lot of things that he did understand about natural selection, but he didn't know why species varied to begin with. Why was there variation among individuals? How were traits passed on from one generation to the next? Why don't these variations just blend? Those were questions that were unclear at the time. However, the answers came along with the study of genetics and DNA. And those things came along afterwards. Remember Gregor Mendel and his peas? I'm sure you studied that in biology class. Mendel's work was published in 1866, seven years after Darwin. DNA was, not, was discovered in 1869. Genes were discovered in 1944. The structure of DNA figured out in 1953. So all of these discoveries that came along later helped prove Darwin's theory. At the time, they were unknown. Still, his book made a strong impression. Let's take a second to clear up one major misconception. There is this idea, I think, among people that evolution is kind of a straight line thing. People worry about whether we've descended from monkeys, but that's not the case. Evolution is a branching off from a common ancestor in different directions based on different adaptations in different environments. And so it's much more like a tree than a straight line. Something to bear in mind. Now there's a number of very interesting predictions that come out of the theory of evolution. And all of these predictions, like any good theory, can be tested. So what are some of those predictions and how have they been tested? The first prediction is that all species must be related. If we all descended from the same initial life, then we're all related one way or another. And scientists have been looking at this in a variety of ways for a lot of years, looking at structures that are very similar, like the shape of the human hand, the bones in the human hand, compared to the bones in the wings of a bat and in the flipper of a whale. All of these bone structures are very similar. So we've looked at the fossil record to prove this, but DNA evidence really put the icing on the cake and sealed the understanding that in fact all species are related from the very simplest to the most complex. Another obvious prediction from the theory of evolution, if things descend and modify to adapt to changing environments, then life should be getting more complex through time. 
And in fact, you've seen that in the fossil record from single-celled organisms to multi-celled to soft-bodied creatures to hard-bodied creatures to fishes and vertebrates and things with legs and land animals, etc. Also, life should become more diverse with time, and obviously that shows up in the fossil record as well. Another thing that derives directly out of the theory of evolution is that some species are going to go extinct, and that's because they won't adapt properly. In fact, the vast majority of all species that ever existed are extinct today. Um, the theory predicts that better adaptive species will replace le less adaptive species, and we should, in fact, have more extinction than survival, and in fact, we do. And finally, the theory says that if you take species and isolate them physically from one another, they should evolve differently. And we see that in many kinds of examples around the world, from the Galapagos finches on separate islands to uh, large land masses like Australia and Madagascar that have broken off of, of a larger supercontinent and, and developed, therefore, very different species. The marsupials in, in Australia, the lemurs in Madagascar that don't exist elsewhere on the Earth. Um, you can even see it from mountaintop to mountaintop in places where plate tectonics has raised the land up, and squirrels, for example, have been separated. So all of these predictions have, have upheld the theory of evolution. They have all uh, been thoroughly tested and found to be true. Well, this is a very complex and interesting diagram. I don't expect you to, to understand or delve into the details of it by any means. It shows all living things that have ever lived on Earth through time, and that's a really complicated thing to do, and their genetic relationship to each other. You can see that the um, that time starts here in the center, and with the very simplest bacteria, and bacteria continue out to today, but after that branches off the eukaryotes, and then the plants, and then the algae, and then the funguses, and as you move around the chart from left to right, you get more and more complex and diverse life coming into play. Notice that time are these dotted lines um, showing different ages. So, so you're, you're going outward in an oval through time. And if you look at any one particular group, such as the fishes here, you can see just on the basis of the shape of these branching lines that through time the fishes have gotten more diverse and more numerous and more complex. Well, let's back up for just a smidge and talk about fossils. One of the main problems with the fossil record as a recording of the history of life on Earth is that it is very incomplete. There is a lot of information there but the vast majority of species that have lived on Earth simply have not left behind any fossil evidence, and that's because it's really, really hard to become a fossil. How do you get to be a fossil? Well, first you have to die. And you have to die somewhere where you're going to be buried before decay or scavengers can tear you up. And you have to be somewhere where the sediment's going to continue to pile up on top of you until you get deep enough to turn into a rock. That's lithification. It really, really helps if you have hard parts like bones or a shell, because that is much more likely to survive all those processes and turn into rock. If you don't have bones or a shell, then you really have to die in a thick fluid like a tar or pitch in order to become a fossil. While you're sitting in that sediment pile, you have to avoid getting dissolved away by the fluids that are circulating around, and they're often a little bit acidic. So be careful about those fluids coming past you, at least until the rock around you have, has gotten hard enough to create a mold, then, then you can dissolve away if you need to. And that's it. If you can survive all of that, you're a fossil, but you're way down deep in the earth, and you've got to get back up to the surface so the paleontologists can find you and look at you. There are very, very few fossils of insects. Um, there are some in, the tar in tar pits and in amber, which is fossilized tree pitch, 
but most of the insects that have ever lived are not fossilized. There are way more marine fossils, ocean fossils, than land fossils, and that's because the ocean environment is a place where sediments pile up just about everywhere, but on land there's actually very few places where sediments are deposited. They're in lakes and ponds, rivers and deltas, a few rift valleys, but most places on land are actually eroding. And so if you die in most places on land, you're not going to become a fossil. So there's about nine or ten times as many marine fossils as terrestrial fossils. That makes it a little hard to use the fossil record as a complete record of life through time, but it gives us an awfully good picture. Now two ideas that geologists use in um, evaluating the fossil record and determining what's happening in geologic history are faunal succession and index fossils. So let's start with faunal succession. This is just a fancy way of saying that species lived in a particular time period and that they follow each other in a reliable and predictable order. If Trilobites are the oldest thing in that region. They're always going to be the oldest thing in that region. And younger than that will be brachiopods. And younger than that will be fishes. And they always come in that order. Faunal succession is a transitive property. Ha! How's that? I'm dragging up an old math term for you in your geology class. Do you remember what transitive means? If A is older than B and B is older than C, then A is older than C as well. That's faunal succession. There's always an order in which things appear. Index fossils are just a really handy way of telling time. An index fossil is a species that lived for a very short time over a very wide distance, and therefore you can use them to pinpoint the age of any rock in which they're found. And scientists have identified 30 or 40 index fossils around the world that are pretty widespread and very short-lived. Here is an example for you. Uh, a rock star like Janis Joplin, who was popular all around the world, but for only a very short time. Um, you can find concert posters of Janis Joplin from Stockholm, from Austin, from Rio, but all of them were made between 1968 and 1970. That's an index fossil for the rock and roll world. And check out those prices, by the way. Wouldn't you like to have a, a huge rock star on your campus for $3? Faunal succession, just so you know, was developed by a guy named William Smith. He was an English surveyor. Actually, he built a lot of roads, and therefore he dug a lot of uh, road cuts, and he observed a lot of fossils. And he came up with the idea, or the observation, really, that when something is really old, it's always on the bottom, and younger stuff always replaces it. Faunal succession is especially useful if you're looking at a fossil assemblage, a group of fossils that always lived together. A fossil assemblage can act like an index fossil, that these people, these, these little critters that are here together in this rock were only here together for a very short period of time. Smith published his work on faunal succession in 1815, and Darwin had read it and understood it before he went on his voyage to the Galapagos. So there it is, evolution, very gradual change we can believe in.